it's a real privilege. Uh, I, I find it a real privilege, and I'm so grateful for God to give me this opportunity to share together what, what the vision that we believe God has for this church for the year. Uh, and uh, basically, the vision is, is, is based on this scripture that from Judah will come the cornerstone, the tent peg, the battle bow, and then every ruler. And I've, I've put a little pictures up of all the four objects. Um, so it's an object, on, an object uh, morning, each morning this, this February. And uh, uh, I, want you, I want you to know that each, each one is not a separate entity. They are all related. God always speaks truth upon truth. Doesn't speak spasmodically all over the place. He adds truth upon truth. And uh, so last week we looked at from Judah. What, what, what does from Judah mean? And, and it's simply this. That Zechariah was speaking prophetically of Jesus Christ. And that when Jesus Christ would appear, he would come as a cornerstone and, and as a tent peg and everything like that. So it's, it's all based in Jesus Christ. And uh, that's so last week we looked at that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. In fact, he's the central feature. When he come, he, he took center stage of everything that's being built. And particularly, we spoke about the cross. That you cannot disassociate Christ from the cross. They are one thing. And so then the message of the cross is central, totally central to our faith. And, it, and it's, it's not a symbolic thing. It's, it's, not, it's not even just a speaking thing. It's when the cross touches your life. That's the issue. The cross touches your life. It's not about dis demonstrating symbols. It's letting the cross of Jesus Christ actually affect your life intimately and personally. So, um, so today we're looking that when Jesus Christ comes, he will come as a tent peg. Now, this was challenging to me um, in many areas, two ways. One was this, I am not a good camper. So um, I, 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 I can't speak really from experience about tent pegs. The second thing was this, that I, could un I couldn't understand what was Zachariah saying? What does it mean? Jesus Christ will come as a tent peg. That was a great challenge to me. Um, and uh, so I had to look in the Word of God where tent peg appears. And it appears several times, not many times. It appears in Exodus when it talks about the tent peg um, uh, secures the tabernacle. They had uh, Moses when he was building the tabernacle. They had to get tent pegs to secure the tabernacle. And then secondly, in Judges, it talks about that glorious story of Jael putting the tent peg through Caesarea's head. As Alex alluded to last time he spoke. What a glorious story, wasn't it, eh? I tell you, that girl, that girl had to do it in one go, didn't she? I, I don't think I could do that. Except if it was Satan, I think I could. But um, we're not referring to those. We're referring to two passages in Isaiah that speak about ten pegs. And I've chosen those and I'm using those because they seem to illustrate and demonstrate what the vision was given to us by the prophets. We, we, we don't think up our own vision. We ask the prophets to declare that is safe. Because God does nothing without revealing his, his, his words to the prophets. So, um, and they said this year was going to be a year of advance. Where we had to leave our comfort zones. Where we had to move out of the boundaries of the church buildings. Where we would take new ground. Where to move in new ways. Are you up for this? So that was the word of God to us, that we were to step out in new ways and extend our boundaries. Exciting, isn't it? So I want us to look in um, the first passage is in Isaiah 54. And, and, and as we look at it, I, I, want you, I want to answer these three questions. Why did God give us that word? 
Secondly, what steps are we to take? And thirdly, how are we going to do it? Okay, so we're going to look at those three things as we look. So if, you, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 54, and I want to read these, these glorious scriptures. Firstly, it says this, Sing, O barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy, you who are never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Strength, lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you are spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Isn't that wonderful? The first thing I want to say this to you is God loves to heal barren people. He loves to do it. He doesn't just want to do it physically. I believe he wants to do it physically. I do believe that. But he wants to do it spiritually. He wants every person to have children. He wants every person to multiply. Do you understand if the, church, if, if the church has a few people added to them during a year, that's addition. If everybody has children, that's multiplication. Do you understand? God wants, I tell you why, because he wants his house filled with children. That's the whole purpose of enlarging your tent. It's to fill his house with his children. That's what he wants. So God wants to, he, God wants you individually. This is to us individually and corporately. But I'm speaking to you individually. God wants to give you fruit. In John 15, it says, you did not choose me, but I chose you that you might bear fruit. The fruit is the Greek in that is fruit of the womb. God wants to give us spiritual children. There's a scripture in Deuteronomy 17 verse 4, which touched my heart once. And it was simply this. No man or woman will be childless. That's God's covenant promise. No man or woman will be childless. When I spoke, God spoke that to me when I was a young man. And I said, I'm going to take hold of that covenant blessing. I'm going to take hold of it. Within one week, this is true, within one week, I led two people to the Lord. Two people came to Jesus. One was in Leeds Hyde Street. He's just come out of Boston. Let me tell you this. The God's covenant blessing to you is this. No man or woman will be childless. You can have spiritual children. In fact, in Proverbs, it says, he who wins souls is wise. Not only that, but he says, your children will dispossess nations and inhabit desolate cities. You won't just have children, they will do mighty things. I tell you this, let me tell you, if you teach children in the Sunday school, when you teach them, teach them with faith. This six-year-old is going to destroy nations. <laughs> How about that? I tell you, I have taught in, the, in, our, in our Covenant College nigh on 30 years. I've taught there. And I've taught all sorts of people over the year. I'm just part of the teaching. And I'm not, I'm not telling this to big me up. But some of these men are apostles. Some of them are leading churches and the nations. In fact, one guy, I only just a few weeks ago come to me as an apostle. He's, 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 he's leading churches. He came up to me um, at a funeral and he said this. Mick, he said, I want you to know what you taught me about the kingdom of God is still with me. I'm a kingdom man. Listen, when you have fruit, it can go all over the place. Do you believe that? I believe this church will send people to other nations. Do you know, I was in a Bible, I was in one of our Bible um, 
meetings in Cardiff. Do turn to that. God will bless you. I was, I was there, and a teenager came up to me, and he said this. Um, Please hear me. I just wanted to show you this as an illustration. He came up to me as a teenager, and he said, Mick, thank you for teaching me when I was a little boy. I taught a Bible week in the, the children's thing. And he came up to me and blessed me up to my eyeball. That I'd teach this little one. And he said, I still remember what you taught me. That's that wonderful, eh? Hey? Listen, listen. God has called you to bear fruit. If you haven't led anybody to the Lord yet, I challenge you, reach out. It's your covenant blessing. Do you know what your reward will be in heaven? It will be the people you've affected in your life. Paul said this in Thessalonians, what is my reward? It is you. That's what Paul said. It's you. That's my greatest reward. Settle in your heart that who you speak to and who you touch will be changed and you will be surprised in heaven. God wants to fill his house with people. Bring Jones taught me one thing. Um, no, he taught me loads of things, actually. <laughs> but he taught me one thing that still remains. He said this, the name of the game is people. Let me say it to you. The name of the game is people. People. God loves people. The, the, the second thing I want to say, what steps do I take? Listen, listen the, what steps should I take? What steps should we as a church take? But particularly, what steps should I take? Let me tell you this. Any step you take in expanding your borders um, is, is, is a faith step. It's a faith step. You don't, you don't enlarge your borders because you're too big. That's not the point. You enlarge your borders so that God can fill the gaps. Do you understand? It's a step of faith. God loves faith. When you step out in faith, God fills it. He does. Several, a few years ago, we planted a church in Neath. We planted a church in May Hill. Our, suddenly our congregation shrunk. No, it didn't. God filled the space. Look, look around. The building is too small for us now. If we want to see more people saved, we have to take steps of faith. I, do you know, there's a lady in the church did, did, It just illustrates this point to me. I, I embarrass her. This is Kalechi. Kalechi came here, and she, she, she came into this country, and she needed work. She needed work and couldn't get work. So she took a step of faith. She bought a set of clothes for work. She didn't have a job. But she bought a set of working clothes. And God said that, saw that step of faith and gave her a job. She's got her own business now, Kalechi, haven't you? God, God loves it when we take steps of faith. Now, um, as it happens, I want to give you two stories of people that took steps of faith. They're, they're wonderful stories. In fact, they were from the tribe of Judah. So I can say from Judah. Um, um, one, is, his name is Caleb. Now, I love, I'll tell you what, I love Caleb. He, he was well past the age of military service. He was past the age of serving in the temple. In fact, he was 85. And he went to God, and he went to Joshua, and he said, I am still strong. I'm going to read it to you. This is just, I just love this story. Let me read it to you. Listen, he said this. Now then, this is Joshua 14. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years. Since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old. 
How about that? There's hope for us all. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country. Oh, stunned. <laughs> give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But with the Lord helping me, I will drive them out. Hallelujah. Oh, I tell you, I'm, I'm up for that. I want to take, I, I take hill country when I'm 85. Listen, folks, do not discount yourself. Do not discount yourself any age. No age. If you're, too, if you're young, God will still give you mountains to take. He will. If you're not too old to take mountains. You, you say, well, it's, it's, I'm a bit immobile now. Well, rob Satan from your rocking chair. It doesn't matter where you are. God wants you to destroy the enemy. And God with you, you can. Listen, folks, you can take mountains. I'm, I'm challenging you this morning. Ask God, give me mountains, Lord. Give me mountains to take. Give me enemies to overcome. Oh, I am so excited about this. We have a room of people that can take mountains for God. The second guy, the second guy, I, I love these people. His name was Jabez. Do you know what his real name was? Pain. That's Jabez means pain. Fancy being called pain. What's your name? Payne Warford. <laughs> his, his, his mother gave birth to him in pain and called him pain. Listen, he, he didn't... Uh, let me read you about Jabez. I love this. Jabez, listen, he asked God... He's, Jabez asked God to extend his borders. And God didn't, God didn't say, well, that's a bit greedy. He didn't say that. He said, you are more honorable than anybody else because you want to extend your border. Listen to this. Now, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I, have, I, I gave birth to him pain. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would enable me, bless me, and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me. And keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. You are not greedy to say to God, extend my boundaries. I want to challenge us. This is very challenging. Listen, I am not just challenging you without challenging me. God wants to extend your boundaries. And, and he wants you to take on new things. I want you to say, commit myself. I'm going to do something new this year. I tell you the biggest thing is this. God wants people who would take responsibility. It's very easy to say, oh, I'll get up and speak. I'll take that. No, God wants you to take on responsibility. He wants you to put your shoulders. There are few people that you can put weight on their shoulders. I would take some responsibility. Take a responsibility on. Move in a new gift. Learn a new language. Speak to new people about Jesus. Join a new group. Step out in a new way. If you do it by faith, God will fill you. Invite a new person along. Am I communicating this? Listen, as a church, God is calling us to do new things. To get outside the building. If we do, God will fill our hearts and this place with more and more people. Hallelujah. I am so excited about this. As a church, God is going to do new things. Ask God, where else 
where are there desolate areas in this, in this city and area? Pray. Pray for them. Maybe God will cause us to reach out there. Third thing is this. He says, strengthen your tent pegs. Now, I, I have to, I come to the conclusion is this, that to en enlarge the borders of a tent, you have to move the tent pegs. Is that right? To have a wider area, you have to move them. But God doesn't say there, move your tent pegs. It says, strengthen your tent pegs. In other words, as Simon um, reminded me just this past week, if you get bigger tents, they weigh heavier, the ropes have to be stronger. You cannot have the same tent pegs in place for bigger tents. It won't work. You have to have bigger, stronger tent pegs if the if if. The tent is to be expanded. Herein lies the great problem of church growth. Individually and as a church. When you grow, you have to grow with it. You have to grow with it. Not just the leaders. The leaders have to grow. But the church has to grow with the growth of the church. Otherwise, when the winds blow... The church can be demolished. So we have to grow. We have to strengthen our tent pegs. Now, now I come to the, <clears throat> the second Isaiah passage. And I, I want to speak this because this is personal, but it's real. In, in, this is in Isaiah 22. And uh, it's speaking of tent pegs from a different context. But it communicates the truth about strength in the tent peg. And it's simply this. Um, in Isaiah 22, it's talking about um, uh, the tent peg that's within the inside of the tent. So you've got, uh, you, you have um, wooden pillars holding up the tent. And, the, and there's a tent peg that's hammered into the wood where you hang all the utilities and all the things that you need. And it's speaking of that sort of tent peg. And what it's talking about was two characters. And it's talking about two people of influence in the palace. One was called Shebna. And the other was called Eliakim. They were two people. Shebna was a wicked man. He was out for himself. Wanted to make a name for himself. Eliakim was a good man who was going to replace him. And I just want to... I just want to read this, this scripture to you. This is in Isaiah 22. Listen to this. He says, I'm just going to read these verses. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Go say to that steward, to Shebna, who is in charge of the palace. What are you doing here? And who gave you permission to cut out a grave for yourself here? Hewing your grave on the heights and chiseling your, your meeting place in the rock. Beware, the Lord is about to take firm hold of you and hurl you away, O oh, you mighty man. He will roll you up tightly like a ball and throw you into a large country. There you would die and there your splendid chariots will remain. You disgrace to your master's house. I would depose you from your office, and you would be ousted from your position. In that day, I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one will shut, and what he shuts, no one open. Incredible authority. I will drive him like a peg into a firm place. He will be a seat of honor for the house of his father. All the glory of his family will hang on him. It's his offspring and offshoots. 
all its lesser vessels from the bowls to the jars. Then he says, in that day, declares the Lord Almighty, the peg, the peg driven into the firm place will give way. It will be sheared off and will fail. And the load hanging on it will be cut down. The Lord has spoken. This, this is the issue. It is irrelevant in this case of whether a person is wicked or whether they are doing things right. In the end, no person can hold the weight of God's glory, which he plans to do. What his purpose is, no man, no man can bear the weight of God. God is planning to move in power. And no man can take the weight of that. I know. I know what it's like. I know when I was at work, I was over-promoted. It's a fearful thing to be over-promoted and not be able to do the task. It's a scary thing. It nearly broke me. It is a too big a thing for us to hold the glory of God. That's the whole point. That's what Zachariah saw. He said there will be a day coming when the Lord Jesus Christ will come as a tent peg. He is the one that will be able to hold everything. He is the one that will not fail. He is the one that will master the glory of God and will never be sheared off. He is the glorious one. He is the tent peg that you can hang everything on. How do you strengthen your tent peg? You tie yourself to him. You tie your peg to his peg. There is no other way that we can manage the glory of God. No charismatic person can do it. They have to be tied to the tent peg. For he can he is totally secure. And you say, how, how can I be tied to the tent peg? Through the cross. Through the cross of Jesus Christ. There is only one way to be united with Christ. And it's through the cross. Look at Romans 6. If we have been died, we have died with him. Through the death and resurrection, we are joined to the living Tempeg. He's not just a living stone, he's a living tempeg. Am I communicating this? Galatians 2:20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let me tell you this, folks. We are not just preaching about the cross. We are not symbolizing it. We are living it. Let the cross of Jesus Christ touch your life. And when it does, it will free you from self. You haven't got to, you haven't got to go through mental gymnastics to deal with yourself. Just join yourself to him. And I tell you this. That's how you can enlarge your boundaries. You won't do it on your own. You would do it by being united to Christ. Oh, folks, let the cross of Jesus Christ touch you personally and intimately. It isn't all talk. It's death and life. Let God touch you in this way I leave I, I just leave this challenges to you can I say this it's, it's so difficult when you preach you can forget everything by the time you had your Sunday dinner but I don't want you to forget this I'm telling you folks get to life group Get to life group. When you get to life group, talk these things through. I want you to ask yourself this. Lord, 
I want to lead people to Jesus. I don't want to be barren. I want to be someone who wins people into the kingdom of God. Let me tell you this. Perhaps one of the most beautiful experiences in my life was seeing my daughter born. I will never forget it. It was beautiful. But it isn't far off rivaled by seeing somebody come from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It is glorious. You are leading someone into eternity. It is magnificent. Don't let Satan rob you of that opportunity. Listen, folks. Ask people to pray for you. Say, Lord, make me fruitful. Secondly, this. Don't, in, in that Isaiah 54, it says, don't hold back. Please, God has not called us to settle. He's never called us to plateau. He's called us to take new ground. He's, take us, he's told us to take new mountains. God told me when, when I was at Bible college, there were, there were several mountains for me to take. I'm still looking for a mountain to take. Please, whatever age you are, ask God to give you mountains. Take new areas. Defeat something in your life. Take land for Jesus. Take your kingdom of God flag and put it somewhere and say, I'm taking this for God. Is that right? Take something for God. Thirdly, when you're together, break bread and ask the Lord, I don't just want to remember what Jesus did when he died for me. I want it to touch my life. I want the cross of Jesus Christ to be the very center and essence of my living. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you for the vision that you are giving us. I thank you that you have come to be the center of our lives, to make the cross real to us in real terms so that we can take land from Satan, so we can extend our influence, so we can come a people that take land for the Lord Jesus. Will you equip us and anoint us and write these things in our hearts? Cause us to be brave enough to commit ourselves to these things. In Jesus' name, amen.